This is Capital Ideas TV. Coming up, the CEO of Nikola Mining, developing a doozy of a copper mine in BC. Rise Gold CEO on reviving a prolific mine in California. A director of New Carolyn Gold on a promising prospect in BC. And a strategic advisor to 360 Blockchain on the company's blockchain and crypto investments. Hello and welcome to Capital Ideas TV. I'm Mark Bunting. British Columbia is one of Canada's top locales for mining activity. Companies large and small pulling large volumes of gold and silver out of the province every day. But all that raw material must be refined before it can be sold. And many companies don't have the means to do that. That's where Nikola Mining has found opportunity. The company owns a gold and silver processing mill in Merritt, BC. It's a new facility that boasts half a million dollars in recent upgrades. The mill is centrally located between several key mining projects in the province's interior, meaning there's no shortage of business coming Nikola's way. The company also owns a tailings pond adjacent to its mill that it will strip of valuable resources over time. These two facilities put Nikola Mining in a rare spot. It's a junior miner that can actually generate cash flow while it ramps up its own properties. And on that front, Nikola has a few irons in the fire, headlined by its new Craigmont property. The company holds full ownership rights to the project, which consists of 20 mineral claims in British Columbia's Goishan Batholith region. Nikola is in the midst of an exploration program and recently turned up some promising copper grades. The company also holds full interest in the nearby Treasure Mountain Silver Deposit, which offers another potential revenue stream down the line. Nikola Mining is optimistic that 2018 will yield more encouraging drill results at New Craigmont. CEO Peter Espig explains what's on the horizon this year and why investors have every reason to be excited. Peter, you've said that this new Craigmont property in BC is a very simple story to understand. How and why is it simple? I think it's simple because it's, there's really two parts to it. One part is the operation, which is uh, a cash flow focused operation. And the other is the Craigmont upside of the, uh, you know, Craigmont mine. And, and one of the things that um, we're really excited about and that we're just starting to tell the story is that, you know, unlike an exploration play, uh, this is a fully permitted mine. It's a historic mine and it's also the highest grade copper mine in the history of North America. And you've got some interesting, exciting drilling results that you're sitting on. What we did is we, we started the, this year we're going to focus on five different areas, one being the, the um, embayment, then we'll look at doing the historic waste piles, the halo around, and the promontory hill, and then the marp. So we just finished drilling on the, uh, the embayment zone. We'll have um, copper uh, grade results coming out in about two weeks. And I think that the market will be pretty excited because we know how they look. We don't have the assays back, but I think it's going to be a home run. Now, uh, you, you touched on some of the things there whereby you can finance yourself. You have a mill, you've got these uh, waste stockpiles sure. you can go through. So what's the most exciting exploration aspect of the, uh, of the project? When I first took over as CEO and, and in discussions with uh, Dr. Paul Johnson, who was the principal geologist at Tech, uh, one of the things that we really wanted to focus on is, is there a halo around the historic pit? Because we knew the cutoff grade of the mine was 0.7%. I mean, to put it in perspective, 0.7% is the highest grade copper mine it would be in North America. So this was a very prolific, the grades were very prolific. And so we started looking at the, the, if there was a halo around it, and we examined about two, close to 3,000 drill holes. And what what our geo geological team could see is that yes, the halo exists, and in that halo, um, you can see that there you would have mineralization in the stockpile. So we will start in at the end of March, doing the exploration on the stockpiles. We'll then drill around the pit, and then we'll go to the embayment zone. So it's it's going to be a busy year, but it's going to be a very exciting year. Let's uh, talk about uh, the cash flow with uh, Nicola and and. Uh sort of the, the other various business operations that you have on the go? When we started, the very first priority that we had is how do we get to cash flowing this asset? And, and so we looked at entering into, we have six um, milling partnerships and, and they're very simple. They're just, you're the miner, you pay your mining costs, we pay our milling costs, we reimburse ourselves and we split it 50-50. So 
Unlike toll milling, these are pure partnerships. It's a 50-50 split. We then uh, we receive material from Merit Green Energy, which is a fly ash. We looked at we have a gravel pit on site, and we are currently looking at options in even in the cryptocurrency market and also in in uh, cannabis grow, uh, greenhouses. Because ultimately, you know, we want to be cash flow positive because that ca positive cash flow will allow you to fund your own exploration. One thing I didn't ask about was the, the, the capital structure. You have pretty high insider ownership. Could you uh, lay that out for us? Yeah, and, and you know, we really have, Nicola really hasn't been active in, in the Cambridge shows or PDAC. We're here for PDAC now, but the first thing we did is that, you know, I believe that management has to invest at the same level as, as um, you know, your typical investor. So when we first started in 2013, when we raised $7 million, that $7 million was almost exclusively insiders. And if you looked at the $12 million that we've raised since 2013, nine and a half is insiders. So insiders control uh, through funds or personally, we control over 60% of the company. So we're vested. I mean, we're, we're in this for the long run. We feel like we're the wave of the future in terms of how people test for things. Uh, we anticipate being the first sample to answer instrument that can process up to 22 pathogens at a time. Whatever you want to test for, you can do it on your own. Uh, you don't have to ship it away to a lab. You don't have to have an expensive microbiologist. It's something you can do on site. You collect that sample, you input it into the machine, you hit a button, an hour later you get the result you're looking for. Bullion buffs know California isn't called the Golden Coast for its beaches. The state is rich in mineral wealth and has been a hotspot for some of the most successful mining projects on the continent. The Grass Valley region has been one of the top producing areas with 13 million ounces of gold to its name. That figure could have been substantially higher were it not for some unfortunate events getting in the way. Here's a look at the historical production of the region's Idaho Maryland Gold Project. It produced 2.4 million ounces of gold between 1926 and 42, making it the second largest mine in the U.S. in 1941. But when America was thrust into the Second World War, the government deemed gold mining a non-essential activity and forced the mine's closure. A lack of working capital kept production from returning to those heights when the mine started up again in 1946. Rise Gold wants to pick up where history left off. It holds full ownership of the Idaho Maryland project and wants to return it to its former glory. The company is working to verify historical records which point to significant mineralization across the property. Rise Gold CEO Benjamin Mossman explains his plan for the project to bring it back into commercial production. So Ben, this mine that Rise Gold has in California has a fascinating history. You've said that it's almost like it's frozen in time. So give us a little uh, a brief uh, overview of the, the history of the mine. Yeah, so this mine is a pretty famous mine. Um, it was in production from about 1860 to 1954. Um, one time was the second biggest gold mine in the entire United States, uh, second only to Homestake. Uh, so a long history of production, produced 2.4 million ounces, an average head grade of 17 grams per ton. So, you know, very high grade. That's the grade that was actually into the mill after dilution. And a uh, long history of mining. Um, was shut down, was forced shut down World War II by the U.S. government. Uh, at the time, they were producing up to 129,000 ounces of gold a year uh, and had made plans and put all the capital in to double production in 1942 from 1,000 tons a day to 2,000 tons a day. So they would have been uh, getting close to the number one producer in the United States, which at the time was Homestake. So, so very large mine, profitable, was forced shut down by the government. Um, that was devastating for the company. They were producing at $19 an ounce, selling at $35 an ounce, paying something like 98% of their money out in dividends. So in comes Rise Gold, and you've got all these old drawings of the mine and you've digitized all those. So tell us about that process and what are you discovering through that? Yeah, so the family that owned the mine had preserved all the documents over all these years and, you know, a small room in their basement had, you know, all the mylar prints, uh, financial records, a lot of detailed information, you know, right down to, you know, how many feet they drilled on a diamond drill bit, 
Uh, so we took all that documents, um, we bought the property last year, it's all private land, um, all the original holdings of the Idaho Maryland mine. Uh, digitized them all, uh, put them into you know, digital form, 3D model. We plotted out the drilling results, historical drill results, about 70,000 meters of historic drilling, uh, channel samples, you know, many reports. So that process took um, about six months. Uh, there's a lot of uh, information there, a lot of um, targets to test. And then we did our first hole um, just in November. Right, so first drill results, and you've also got some new research, which leads you to believe that you probably have more gold value than you thought. Yeah, and the interesting thing about, I mean, this mine was a very big mine, but in a different era. So it's, it's a bit hard to um, think of it, you know, how they would mine back in the 40s. And so our first hole was a very good intercept, it was 12 grams per ton, uh, over 8 meters true width. So, so very good grades over um, quite wide, uh, quite a wide width, which we weren't really expecting. And, and uh, what we saw with the assaying was that a lot of gold, uh, there's a lot of gold values in the walls of the quartz veins themselves, which based on historic data um, was unexpected because in the past they focused only on mining the quartz. So we've been doing uh, more research to understand that and found some documents recently where they're talking about their mining methods and they, they've mined it visually, quartz alone, and don't talk about any of these values of gold in the wall. So, so more drilling is required to follow that up, but you know, if we can show more results, like that first result, uh, which was the Brunswick One vein, uh, there's many other veins in the mine, many targets to test. So, so even though we have all this information from the past production, um, there's a lot of new things that we're finding uh, along the way. We're just getting started. You mentioned that the mine uh, was flooded and that your, your, your main shaft, the New Brunswick shaft, is still flooded. So what kind of challenges does that present? Yeah, so the mine's flooded. Uh, the water is quite, quite good, actually. It's um, there's some iron and manganese in it, which are, which are regular kind of minerals you'd find in groundwater, but, but not much else. And we recently sent uh, an ROV down the shaft to, to look at the condition of it, and, and the shaft is actually in surprisingly good condition. You know, the timber work is all in place. Um, because it's underwater, there's very little oxygen. Uh, the wood actually doesn't rot underwater. And even the steel, um, we pull out some steel staples from the underground shaft, which are you know, basically not even rusted. Mm. So, so down the road, I mean, right now, it's, uh, a lot of exploration has to be done from surface. Um, but, but once that, uh, once we start, you know, making new discoveries and building resource, uh, that shaft is a very valuable asset to do that from scratch. I mean, this shaft goes down 3,400 feet. Um, it would be uh, very expensive to do that. Um, so, so it's going to be useful down the road here. So it really opens up a lot of new targets, especially in the Brunswick mine. And that was what really interesting about uh, that first intercept. It's just below the 1,600 foot level in the Brunswick. Um, there's about a dozen veins all parallel to each other. And the Brunswick One vein where this intercept is is actually what's one of the least important veins of the Brunswick mine, which produced almost uh, 800,000 ounces. Produced about 10% of that total. And then right below that, on the 2300 foot level, there's a drift that they put in exploration, which is through that same vein, it's mineralized um, the entire length of it. So you do have some evidence that that vein does continue to at least that depth. So that opens a lot of opportunities to explore you know, closer to uh, the existing workings and the shaft. Um, so, so it could be, uh, it could be quite uh, a surprise for a lot of people uh, as we progress things. So Rise Gold is trying to revive this uh, formerly producing mine in the U.S., second biggest, as you said, back in the day. So just wrap it up here and make the investment case to investors who are looking for ideas, who, who may be intrigued, uh, but also you've got, you also sort of early days and their challenges too. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, there were, it's early days, um, but a, a deposit like this is very rare. And many of the, you know, very successful companies today, you know, started out with, with an old uh, producer, you know, did some more drilling, had a different theory. But uh, these systems are, are large. And this Grass Valley Gold Camp, you know, produced 13 million ounces when these mines were shut down, uh, three mines right next to each other, and, and New Mine owns the Empire Mine right beside us. Uh, they're producing 271,000 ounces a year, so.
Uh, so we finance top tier companies in the medical cannabis industry in exchange for a royalty. I, I love the royalty model. I think it works perfectly for uh, this industry at this time. Debt is largely not available in the U.S. Um, and equity uh, can be massively dilutive. And the reality is every company in California and most states right now is a startup company. Uh, so we offer a very attractive, either a complement uh, or an attractive alternative to debt or equity, uh, which really aligns our financial interests with the interests of the people that we invest in. So when they're successful, we're successful. And the more successful they are, the more successful we are. If there's one thing geologists like to see when they're exploring, it's familiar patterns in the earth. That's because certain rock formations tend to host valuable minerals. So when geologists see them, they know there's a good chance they're onto something good. New Carolyn Gold believes it's found one of those hidden gems in the mountains of British Columbia. The junior miner has acquired the rights to the bulk of the Quiquiala Gold Belt near the City of Hope. Its Ladner Gold project spans 150 square kilometers along the Hosamine Fault and boasts 30 known high-grade occurrences of the yellow metal. But most importantly, it bears geological patterns similar to California's Motherlow District and the Bridge River Gold Camp in BC. Yet there has been very little exploration work done on the project. New Carolyn Gold is stepping up to the plate. The company is fresh off a $1.5 million equity financing it wrapped up in February. Now it's ready to kickstart an underground exploration campaign at the Ladner Project with its mining permit already in hand. Company director and mining veteran Bob Lund discusses key drilling targets and why he believes the results will expose the Ladner Project's immense potential. So Bob, this mine was active in the 1980s for a couple of years, then it was dormant, and now uh, New Carolyn comes in and, and you want to apply modern techniques to see what you have there. Is that, is that the case? You know, we're, now what we've done is really come back and taken a scientific approach with modern technology and knowledge and done all of the background scientific work that needed to be done to really approach this from a methodol you know, a real methodology. Because we had to rehab the underground for safety and, and you know, we had to bring power in and we had to do a, a lot of work that is the non-exciting stuff, but it's safety compliance. It's the kind of stuff, you know, that, you know, for common sense and to make the government happy. You have to have done all of that to prepare for today when we can start doing the exciting stuff. You touched on infrastructure. Is it uh, quite up to date uh, and, and the other assets you have there? Well, you know, there's, there's certain assets. There's a tailings pond already constructed. There's 11 kilometers of adits. They're in pristine shape and we've just, again, done all the work we need to do, scale them, new roof bolts, new ladders, what have you checked the ventilation system, made sure all of that was compliant. So we're really in a situation where, you know, if someone new was going to come in and try and recreate what we have, it might cost you $100 million to get to where we are today. So what do you think the economics of this mine are potentially? Well, you know, there's, there's, two, there's always two components to this. There's, there's the CapEx, you know, what's your capital expense to start? And that's where that $100 million dollars in, in money you don't have to spend becomes a big, big, big deal. And then the second, the second element with any mining operation is what's your operation expense, right? And the key there is we can bring hydro right in off the highway. So we're not flying diesel fuel to the wrong side of, the, of a mountain in the Yukon. You know, we've literally got hydro here. And if we want to, um, We've got the mining permits in place. We've got the ability to do this. But if we decided that we wanted to just, you know, do a, you know, a significant concentrate on site and then ship it elsewhere, you know, to mill it or to refine it, you know, it's just down the road and, and Hope is only 15 kilometers away, which has got all of the rail lines to go anywhere you want. Whether you want to take it to port in Vancouver and, you know, on a boat to China or you want to take it on a train to, to Ontario, whatever you wanted to do, that's, that's easy, but you also have Hope who wants this business. So we don't have to put a camp in and pay for everyone's meals and everyone's expenses. And we literally could have a workforce that sleeps at home every night. It's a tremendous, tremendous advantage. So we got the CapEx and the OpEx advantages, which makes it you know, very attractive just from a business point of view. Because, you know, when you look at a mining situation, obviously grade 
comes into it because that's you're going to be your your revenue and then you have to have good metallurgy which by the way when they were producing in the 1980s they hadn't figured the metallurgy out but one of the, one of the first things we did is get the metallurgy solved so that now you know what your revenue is going to be and now your costs are you know in excellent shape because of location and infrastructure and all of these things so now you've got the opportunity if you can prove the critical mass you can get, get enough there now you've got a business. Now let's talk numbers here. You've raised 1.5 million recently. You did a one for 10 consolidation. You've canceled some options. So what do you think that says to the investor community? What's well, the well, well, you know, the big that? thing we wanted to do, and we had significant players that said to us, you know, your, your stock structure is too heavy. You need to fix this. And so, and they said, literally, if you fix it, you know, it's the field of dreams. If you fix it, we will come. Mm -hmm. Well, they've come. And I literally had one of the top geologists in Vancouver, an old friend of mine who's a business guy and a brilliant guy. And I went to him and I said, okay, I know you've liked the project historically. We roll the stock back, are you in? And he went, he came back, said, I love it. And he put a hundred grand in and his friends put a hundred grand in. And they are dying to take our results because they, again, believe what we're gonna be able to tell the public and take this to Europe and that will be the plan. But we want to go tell this to a senior audience soon. So uh, exploratory work, feasibility, production, what does that timeline look like, do you think? I mean, so it's exciting times. We've got you know, a major plan um, to prove the economics of the existing structure and then to work out from there to augment some of the other holes and some of the other areas that we know of and then the bigger plan is to go forward because again, it is a huge property with you know gold showings all the way up and down of it, you know to go explore all of that. It really is like a district play, and you know there's enough room for four or five companies to come play with us, but we're pretty happy that we own it all. Right now you walk inside a truck and you see multiple devices. You see a fleet management device, you see a two-way radio, black box, tablet of some sort, front camera, six to $10,000 worth of equipment, we're shrinking down to less than $1,000 in one device. The change in the cabin is just dramatic. It's just much, much safer for the truck driver to be able to use one device. Really what we're doing is we're creating a new environment and a new technology that has not been seen to date in, in the market. If you're looking for a sign that blockchain technology is going mainstream, you only have to do one thing, and that's follow the money. The amount of investment pouring into blockchain startups over the past few years has been significant, and it's only building. CB Insights has done some legwork and tracked the financing history of blockchain. In 2012, investment into blockchain was practically non-existent, but then activity started to pick up in a hurry. Over the next five years, a cumulative $2.3 billion found its way into the sector. Last year's estimated $831 million across 188 deals was the largest single year to date. It isn't just venture capital firms getting in on the action. Corporate giants are talking a big game when it comes to blockchain as well, and they're putting their money where their mouths are. Corporations pumped $327 million worth of investment into blockchain companies in the first nine months of last year. That put it on pace to be the largest year yet at about $400 million. 2015 and 2016 saw similar totals, suggesting a consistent interest for corporations in blockchain's potential. 360 Blockchain is among the big believers. It's made a series of investments in early stage blockchain startups and remains on the hunt for acquisitions. The company has identified a few key industries where it sees serious potential and is focusing its efforts there. Here is strategic advisor Jeff Coyan on what those sectors are and how 360 Blockchain is looking to pounce on the opportunity. So with 360 Blockchain, you look for talent, teams, and technology. So what's your criteria when you're looking at making an investment in a blockchain company? Well, the blockchain space is, as you know, it's volatile and it's a little crazy and chaotic. And there's a lot of people throwing around big ideas. We like to stick to fundamentals. We want to invest in a traditional manner. We want to see teams that understand their space. We want category expertise. We want technology that's unique and solving problems, and ideally some code that's already been shipped. In other words, technology that's actually in, in demo stage or close to release. 
Now, there are a lot of people who say blockchain is just going to change the world, change every industry, but you're, you're not necessarily uh, believing that, saying it's not great for every industry mm -hmm. just yet. So you focus on certain areas such as uh, loyalty programs, media, uh, human resources. Why, why those areas? Why are those attractive? Well, I, I absolutely believe blockchain will change the world, but I also agree with myself that it's not going to change every industry. Um, it will impact our lives in ways that the consumers might not even notice. In the same way that you may forget that your phone in your pocket is connected to the internet constantly. We've kind of forgotten that. Blockchain is going to do the same thing, and certain industries are ready for it now. Certain industries will come along later, but things like media, uh, media properties, um, loyalty programs, which really are also already giant databases. But a loyalty program, for instance, will benefit from being put on the blockchain in that it could share the resources and reduce redundancies. And we think other industries like media um, can benefit in the same way now, today. Jeff, uh, let's talk about some of the companies that uh, 360 Blockchain has invested in, such as Arcology, SV Crypto Lab, Pressland, to your point about media. So give us a brief overview of those uh, three for now and, and why you're excited about them. Great. Pressland is the first one that we're closing right now. Uh, it's not our first uh, acquisition, but we're closing it uh, basically as we speak. It's, uh, it was launched in 2004 as Yelp for the Media. So it was, this is a great example of an existing service that will benefit and, and revolutionize uh, the industry by going blockchain. So it's a media database that's going to become a platform for media trust. Um, Arcology is a new blockchain itself. It's going to be generation 3.0 of a new blockchain platform. So we're hoping to go after the Ethereum and solve problems that um, platforms like Ethereum and Waves are running into. And SV Crypto Lab is a crypto mining operation, which is sort of an experiment in revenue streams. We're using the uh, revenue, and we, we're generating revenue right now, from the crypto mining to fund a hackerspace. And do you think the better route to go for most companies, most crypto miners, is uh, using solar, using wind, other renewable energy? Well, yes, I, I do think there's a lot of exciting projects out there that are being paired with renewable energy sources. But I also am really excited, and we have something in the works that we're not announcing quite yet, is the idea of pairing different industries. So if you're generating excess heat, where can you put that heat? Rather than venting it out or you know, building in the side of uh, a mountain or next to a, a, you know, a, a solar power farm, use that heat to do something else. So that's where I think the real future is, is sort of cooperative use of these excess uh, heat. Let's take a step back and look at blockchain. You've used the analogy that blockchain uh, is an airplane. It's up in the air. It's legit. It's not going away. But it needs to evolve. There need to be a lot of adjustments made. So, so where do we stand right now with blockchain? It's been said before, and it's, it's valid. Um, it's, it's a cliche by now to say that blockchain is sort of the internet in the 90s. But it's absolutely true. It's up and it's running, and a lot, of the, a lot of the innovators are kind of running by the seat of their pants, and that's okay. This is the innovation stage. That's why we're also seeing the hype cycles come to blockchain, and they're going to come again. It's just like the internet in the 90s to the late 90s. Five years from now, again, it's going to be in your pocket in ways that you never imagined. So if I'm an investor and I've been looking at the blockchain sector, which was red hot several months ago, now it's kind of languishing, uh, what should I be thinking uh, uh, about trying to invest in, in, in this sector if, I, if I'm skeptical and a little bit nervous? Well, blockchain is scary um, and it's associated with cryptocurrencies and that's not going to go away. The separation of blockchain and cryptocurrency is essentially over. They are more connected than ever. And the markets are so volatile and, and they could really scare people that want to step in. And that's, that's understandable, but that's why we're here. We're investing in a number of different projects. We're diversified. Some of our revenue is coming from cryptocurrency, but most of it is not. We're going to get traditional revenue sources through blockchain companies. From the heart of the financial district in downtown Toronto, that's our show for this week. I'm Mark Bunting. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss an episode. And for more great research and great investment ideas through our weekly digest and morning note, subscribe to CapitalIdeasResearch.com. Thanks a lot for watching and thanks for investing like a pro. We'll see you next time.